field guide to lost things. Acacias. I walked towards the alley des Acacias. On certain days when I had missed her in the alley des Acacias, I would be so fortunate as to meet her in the alley de la Reine Marguerite, where a woman went who wished to be alone, or to appear to be wishing to be alone. Afternoon sky. Sometimes in the afternoon sky, a white moon would creep up like a little cloud, furtive, without display. Agate marble. I kissed the agate marble, which was the better part of my love's heart, the part that was not frivolous but faithful. I read over again a page which, although it had not been written to me by Gilbert, came to me, nonetheless, from her, that page by Bergotte upon the beauty of the old myths from which Racine drew his inspiration which, with the agate marble, I always kept within reach. Air. Her hand, at the same time, sketched in the air an indelicate gesture. Now don't stay here all day. You can go up to your room if you are too hot outside, but get a little fresh air first. Don't start reading immediately after your food. The fresh air made one hungry. Then after patterning everywhere the violet velvet of the evening air, abruptly soothed, they would return and be absorbed in the tower. You'll come away more up in the air than I am. All manner of birds. All the hats now were immense, covered with fruits and flowers and all manner of birds. Almonds. I felt suddenly, as I rose again, a bittersweet fragrance of almonds steal towards me from hawthorn blossom. I imagined that this fragrance must lie concealed, as the taste of an almond cake lay in the burned parts, or the sweetness of Mademoiselle Vintoy's cheeks beneath her freckles. American eye. Upon my word and soul, you can see at a glance, she's got the American eye, that girl has. Ampelopsis. Elsewhere, again, might be seen the first awakening of this May time of the leaves, and those of an ampelopsis, a smiling miracle, like a red hawthorn flowering in winter, had that very morning all come out, so to speak, in blossom. Ancient trees. I aspired already to be an author, and truly nothing can be finer, sweeter, more refreshing for a writer than the sight of the somber mass of foliage formed by the ancient trees of the garden. Animal. But all the things in life that have once existed tend to recur, and like a dying animal that is once more stirred by the throes of a convulsion which was apparently ended, upon Swan's heart, spared for a moment only, the same agony returned of its own accord to trace the same cross again. He knew that this thought had jumped in after him, and had settled down upon his knee, like a pet animal which he might take everywhere. It's a most engaging animal. It's not often you see an animal so well behaved at that age. The very words which the last convulsions of an inoffensive animal in its death agony ring from the peasant who is engaged in taking its life. Animal's consciousness. I had only the most rudimentary sense of existence, such as may lurk and flicker in the depths of an animal's consciousness. Animals. He now noticed, for the first time, roused by the unexpected arrival of so belated a guest, the scattered pack of splendid, effortless animals. Ankle. Ah, if he could only manage to prevent it, if she could sprain her ankle before starting, if the driver of the carriage which was to take her to the station would consent, no matter how great the bribe, to smuggle her to some place where she could be kept for a time in seclusion, that perfidious woman. And Hill. Words present to us little pictures of things, lucid and normal, like the pictures that are hung on the walls of schoolrooms to give children an illustration of what is meant by a carpenter's bench, a bird, an anthill. Apple trees. It was while going the Meglise way that I first noticed the circular shadow which apple trees cast upon the sunlit ground and also those impalpable threads of golden silk which the setting sun weaves slantingly downwards from beneath their leaves. Apricots. Apricots because they were still hard to get. Aquatic gardening. 
But further on, the courage slackened, where the stream ran through a property thrown open to the public by its owner, who had made a hobby of aquatic gardening. Arm. I touch your arm. It's often quite boring enough to have to give a dinner party, but if one had to offer one's arm to Spartacus, to let him take one down. Mama pinched my arm sharply and said in a loud voice, Good morning, Francois. Monsieur Swann seized my grandfather by the arm and cried, Oh, my dear old friend, how fortunate we are to be walking here together on such a charming day. When he proposed to take leave of Odette and to return home, she begged him to stay a little longer and even detained him forcibly, seizing him by the arm as he was opening the door to go. Arms. Custom came to take me in her arms, carried me all the way up to my bed, and laid me down there like a little child. Elevated to the height of an institute, interrupted Qatar, raising his arms with mock solemnity. How readily would I have sacrificed them all just to be able to cry all night long in the arms of Mama. I would fall into the arms of my mother. In my newfound confidence and joy, I wept upon his printed page as in the arms of a long lost father. Most fortunate for France, he recited wickedly, shooting up both arms with great vigor. She had entered the room with her arms pressed close to her sides, even when there was no crowd to be squeezed through. She might perhaps be seized by the whim which, it was possible, had never yet seized her, or falling into the arms of Forcheville. She would jump in beside him and hold him in her arms until the carriage drew up at the Verderins. She would procure an invitation for him also, and to lull to rest in her arms the anguish that still tormented him. Yet he would not have wished to live until the time came when he no longer loved her, when she would have no reason for lying to him, when at length he might learn from her whether on the day when he had gone to see her in the afternoon, she had or had not been in the arms of Forcheville. Asparagus. Francoise, if you had come in five minutes ago, you would have seen Madame Imbert go past with some asparagus twice the size of what Mother Callot has. It's a regular disease of asparagus you have got this year. You will make our Parisians sick of it. I've still to dress the asparagus. Many years later, we discovered that if we had been fed on asparagus day after day and throughout that whole season, it was because the smell of the plants gave the poor kitchen maid, who had to prepare them, such violent attacks of asthma that she was finally obliged to leave my aunt's service. The light crowns of azure which capped the asparagus shoots above their pink jackets would be finely and separately outlined star by star, as in Giotto's fresco are the flowers banded about the brows. What fascinated me would be the asparagus, tinged with ultramarine and rosy pink, which ran from their heads, finally stippled in mauve and azure, into a series of imperceptible changes to their white feet, still stained a little by the soil of their garden bed, a rainbow loveliness that was not of this world. What, Francoise, more asparagus! You know quite well that he can never grow anything but wretched little twigs of asparagus, not asparagus at all. Astral body. It was now an astral body. Atmosphere. And yet he was inclined to suspect that the state for which he so much longed was a calm, a peace which would not have created an atmosphere favorable to his love. What agony he suffered as he watched that light in whose golden atmosphere were moving behind the closed sash the unseen and detested pair. Atmospheric disturbances. I never allow myself to be influenced in the smallest degree either by atmospheric disturbances or by the arbitrary divisions of what is known as time. Atmospheric variation. Thus it came about that a mere atmospheric variation would be sufficient to provoke in me that modulation without there being any need for me to await the return of a season. Atom. I could not discover in them one atom of pleasure. Autumn. I formed the habit of going out by myself on such days and walking towards Meglise La Vigneuse during that autumn when we had to come to Combray to settle the division of my aunt Leonine's estate. My sense of exultation was due not only to admiration of the autumn tints, but 
but to a bodily desire. My walks that autumn were all the more delightful because I used to take them after long hours spent over a book. The beauty for which the firs and acacias of the Bois de Boulogne made me long, more disquieting in that respect than the chestnuts and lilacs of Trianon, which I was going to see, was not fixed somewhere outside myself in the relics of an historical period, in works of art, in a little temple of love at whose door was piled an oblation of autumn leaves ribbed with gold. We used to see passing up and down, obliquely raised towards the heavens, her handsome face with its brown and wrinkled cheeks, which with age had acquired almost the purple hue of tilled fields in autumn. When in Paris, if we stay indoors, being so near and yet prevented from witnessing the transformation scene of autumn, which is drawing so rapidly to a close without our assistance, we feel a regret for the fallen leaves that becomes a fever and may even keep us awake at night. Avalanche. An avalanche of miseries and maladies coming, one after another, without interruption into the bosom of a family, will not make it lose faith in either the clemency of its God or the capacity of its physician. Balzacian flora. Come with the primrose, with the cannon's beard, with the gold cup. Come with the stone crop, whereof our posies made, pledges of love, in the Balzacian flora. Come with that flower of the resurrection morning, the Easter daisy. Come with the snowballs of the Geller rose, which begin to embalm with their fragrance the alleys of your great ant's garden, ere the last snows of Lent are melted from its soil. Banks. We met him strolling on the banks. Beach. My grandmother, who held that when one went to the seaside, one ought to be on the beach from morning to night to taste the salt breezes, and that one should not know anyone in the place because calls and parties and excursions were so much time stolen from what belonged, by rights, to the sea air. Beak. Its beak, as it disappeared below the rim, conferred the part. Bear. I do not understand very clearly why, in order to refrain from going to the houses of people whom one did not know, it should be necessary to cling to one's independence, nor how that could give one the appearance of a savage or a bear. I make myself seem ill-bred, uncivilized, an old bear. Beard. When his beard comes, he'll be Mahomet himself. Beast of the field. He regards, or so they tell me, its author, one Bergot, Esquire, as a subtle scribe, more subtle indeed than any beast of the field. Beautiful features. Certainly my mother's beautiful features seemed to shine again with youth that evening as she sat gently holding my hands and trying to check my tears. Belly. And even in the case of the poor kitchen maid, was not our attention incessantly drawn to her belly by the load which filled it. Bird. At first the piano complained alone, like a bird deserted by its mate. The violin heard and answered it, as from a neighboring tree. I could hear the whistling of trains, which, now nearer and now farther off, punctuating the distance like the note of a bird in the forest. Madame Verderin, perched on her high seat like a cage bird whose biscuit has been steeped in mulled wine, would sit aloft and sob with fellow feeling. Offering to the bird in abundance the fruit or grain at which it appeared to be pecking. Was it a bird? Was it the soul, not yet made perfect, of the little phrase? Was it a fairy, invisibly somewhere lamenting, whose plaint the piano heard and tenderly repeated? You may see a bird flying across the pink. It draws near the borderline, touches it, enters, and is lost upon the black. Bird-like eyes. She would utter a shrill cry, shut tight her little bird-like eyes, which were beginning to be clouded over by the cataract, and quickly, as though she had only just time to avoid some indecent sight or to parry a mortal blow, bury her face in her hands, which completely engulfed it and prevented her from seeing anything at all, she would appear to be struggling to suppress, to eradicate a laugh which, were she to give way to it, must inevitably leave her inanimate. Birds. I would contrive, with the infinite patience of birds building their nests, its drops, like migrating birds which fly off in a body at a given moment, would come down out of the sky in close marching order. Swan watched them as they listened to the pianoforte intermezzo, 
lists St. Francis preaching to the birds, which came after the flute and followed the virtuoso in his dizzy flight. The cries of the birds wheeling to and fro about it seemed to intensify its silence, to elongate its spine still further, and to invest it with some quality beyond the power of words. The three steeples were always a long way ahead of us, like three birds perched upon the plain, motionless and conspicuous in the sunlight. Black cloud. Just look at that black cloud behind the steeple, and how poor the light is on the slates. You may be certain it will rain before the day is out. Black eyes. The black eyes gleamed. Black night. What little daylight yet remained was failing, and it seemed as though a black night was immediately to fall on them. Black sun. I saw these in the hot light of a summer morning, blazed like a black sun. Blemish. She should incline towards me that face on which there was, beneath her eye, something that was, it appears, a blemish, and which I loved as much as all the rest. Block of ice. A single word from Audette sufficed to penetrate through all Swan's defenses, and like a block of ice immobilized it, congealed its fluidity, made it freeze altogether. Blood. By keeping the blood there in circulation, it would make less frequent the chokings and other pains to which she was liable. Blue. Besides, she doesn't care for him in that way, she says. It's an ideal love. Platonic, you know. She's afraid of rubbing the bloom off. Oh, I don't know half the things she says. How should I? Blossom. For a long time afterwards, it was not against a wall gay with spikes of bur purple blossom, but on a wholly different background, the porch of a Gothic cathedral, that I would see outlined the figure of one of the women of whom I dreamed. In that moist and gentle atmosphere, these heavenly flower beds will break into blossom in a few moments in the evenings, incomparably lovely and often lasting for hours before they fade. Blue eyes. I'll leave you in peace now. I know when I'm not wanted. She ended discreetly and left Swan with the girl who had the blue eyes. Blue mustache. I can quite see the good points there are in his portrait of my husband. Oh, dear me, yes. And it's certainly less odd than most of what he does. But even then he had to give the poor man a blue mustache. Blue sky. May you always see a blue sky overhead, my young friend. And then, even when the time comes, which is coming now for me, when the woods are all black, and when night is fast falling, you will be able to console yourself, as I am doing, by looking up to the sky. Body. Already it had passed into a soul. Already the little phrase which it evoked shook like a medium the body of the violinist. Françoise never went out of her room for an instant, never took off her clothes, allowed no one else to do anything for my aunt, and did not leave her body until it was actually in its grave. He had intended to leave time for her mind to overtake her body's movements. He should not be present when the body was laid in its coffin. He slipped his arm around her shoulder, supporting her body against his own. Her frail and disordered body was still able to endure. If, from those dreams, the memory of her could no longer be eliminated, then her bodily imperfections would be no longer be of the least importance, nor would the conformity of her body, more or less than any other, to the requirements of Swan's taste, since having become the body of her whom he loved, it must henceforth be the only one capable of causing him joy or anguish. Like a solid body surprised at some unknown point in its revolution, like the idealist philosopher whose body takes account of the external world in the reality of which his intellect declines to believe. The same self which had made me salute her before I had identified her now urged me to catch the ball that she tossed to me. Mademoiselle Vantoy greeted her without rising, clasping her hands behind her head, and drew her body to one side of the sofa. Madame Verderon's whole body stiffened. My body had turned about for the last time. My body lay stretched out in bed, my eyes staring upwards, my ears straining, my nostrils sniffing uneasily, and my heart beating. My body, conscious that its own warmth was permeating hers, would strive to become one with her, and I would awake. My body, still too heavy with sleep to move, would make an effort to construe the form which its tiredness took as an orientation of its various members, 
so as to indeed deduce from that where the wall lay and the furniture stood, to piece together and to give a name to the house in which it must be living. My body, the side upon which I was lying, loyally preserving from the past an impression which my mind should never have forgotten. My cheek was still warm with her kiss, my body bent beneath the weight of hers. No sooner had the warm liquid with the crumbs with it touched my palate than a shudder ran through my whole body, and I stopped, intent upon the extraordinary changes that were taking place. Oh, you do make me so miserable, she cried, with a jerk of her body, as though to shake herself free of the constraint of this question. She was screened from me by the stooping body of her friend. Some tiny trace of contrariety in his mind, or his weakness in his body, by inciting him to regard the present as an exceptional moment, or one not to be governed by the rules, one in which prudence itself would allow him to take advantage of the soothing effects of the pleasure. The attraction which her body held for him had aroused a painful longing to secure the absolute mastery of even the tiniest particle of her heart. The body of Golo himself, being of the same supernatural substance as his steeds, overcame all material obstacles. The constant iteration had gradually remolded her body. The figure of this girl had been enlarged by the additional symbol which she carried in her body. The quick relief of its slender, allegorical body, the stiffened side underneath my body would, for instance, in trying to fix its position, imagine itself to be lying face to the wall in a big bed with a canopy. Wow. A month after the evening on which he had intercepted and read Odette's letters to Forcheville, Swan went to a dinner which the Verderans were giving in the Bois. After dinner, if he had an early appointment in the Bois or at St. Cloud, he would rise from table and meet the house so abruptly, especially if it threatened to rain, and so to scatter the faithful before their normal time. Gone to dine upon the island in the Bois, he had long since emerged from the paths and avenues of the Bois. He had almost reached his own house, and still, for he had not yet thrown off the intoxication of grief, or his whim of insincerity, but was ever more and more exhilarated by the false intonation, the artificial sonority of his own voice. He continued to perorate aloud in the silence of the night. He hoped that, someday, he might be able to hear the island in the Bois, or the Princesse de Lombe mentioned, mentioned without feeling any twinge of that old rending pain. He preferred to walk, and it was on foot through the wall that he came home. He would imagine that Odette was Forcheville's mistress, and that when they had both sat watching him from the depths of the Verdun's Landau in the Bois on the evening before the party at Chateau, to which he had not been invited. I could feel that the wall was not really a wood, that it existed for a purpose alien to the life of its trees. I had risen and left the house to go to Trino, passing through the Bois de Boulogne. I think it was in the Bois, one evening when you came to meet us on the island. I would guide Francois in the direction of the Bois de Boulogne. If, when Odette wished to go for a walk in the morning along the avenue du Bois de Boulogne, his duty as a good husband had obliged him though he had no desire to go out, to accompany her, carrying her cloak when she was too warm. In the evening, when he did not stay at home until it was time to meet Odette at the Verderens, or rather, at one of the open-air restaurants, which they liked to frequent in the Bois, and especially at St. Cloud, he would go to, the, to dine in one of those fashionable houses in which, at one time, he had been a constant guest. It is an admirable street to live in because it's only a few minutes' walk from the wall. Nature began again to reign over the wall, from which had vanished all trace of the idea that it was the Elysian Garden of Women. One evening, when, irritated by the thought of that inevitable dark drive together, he had taken his other little girl all the way to the wall. Swan had left before the coffee came in to join the Verderas on that island in the wall. That sense of the complexity of the Bois de Boulogne, which made it an artificial place and, in a zoological or mythological sense of the word, a garden. I captured again this year as I crossed it on my way to Trianon on one of those mornings early in November. 
That won't bore you, will it? A quiet little dinner now and then in the Bois. The Bois had the temporary, unfinished, artificial look of a nursery garden or a park in which, either for some botanic purpose or in preparation for a festival, there have been embedded among the trees of commoner growth, which have not yet been uprooted and transplanted elsewhere, a few rare specimens with fantastic foliage which seem to be clearing all around themselves an empty space, making room, giving air, diffusing light. The different parts of the Bois, so easily confounded in summer in the density and monotony of their universal green, were now clearly divided. Then it befell the Maison Dorée, as it had befallen the island in the Bois, that gradually its name ceased to trouble him. They walked the Bois their headed. This, the Bois, equally complex, uniting a multitude of little worlds, distinct and separate, placing a stage set with red trees, American oaks, like an experimental forest in Virginia, next to a fir wood by the edge of the lake, or to a forest grove from which would suddenly emerge in a lissom covering of firs with the large, appealing eyes of a dumb animal, a hastening, hastening walker was the garden of woman. Bone. As if it weren't just the andante that breaks every bone in my body. Bones. She would hold out for me to kiss her sad brow, pale and lifeless, on which at this early hour she would not yet have arranged the false hair and through which the bones shone like the points of a crown of thorns. What a lazy bone. Bookworm. What fun it would be to become a regular bookworm, to bury my nose in a lot of old papers. Bosom. His jealousy was not satisfied that he had yet suffered enough and sought to expose his bosom to an even deeper wound, pointing to her bosom. She received him, wearing a wrapper of mauve crepe de chine, which draped her bosom like a mantle with a richly embroidered web. Bows. I would hasten eagerly to the spots where masterpieces of female elegance would be incarnate for a few moments beneath the unconscious accommodating bows. Brain. As soon as I asked myself the question and tried to discover some subjects to which I could impart a philosophical significance of infinite value, my mind would stop like a clock. I would see before me vacuity. Nothing would feel either that I was wholly devoid of talent or that, perhaps, a malady of the brain was hindering its development. At odd moments, no doubt, in the furthest recesses of his brain, where his determination had thrust it away, and thanks to the length of the interval, the three weeks separation to which he had agreed, it was with pleasure that he would consider the idea that he would see Odette again on her return. But it was also with so little impatience that he began to ask himself whether he would not readily consent to the doubling of the period of so easy an abstinence. From what I had been told of them, I would arrange them in the order of their talent in lists, which I used to murmur to myself all day long, lists which in the end became petrified in my brain and were a source of annoyance to it, being irremovable. He could not explore the idea further, for a sudden access of that mental lethargy which was, with him, congenital, intermittent, and providential, happened at that moment to extinguish every particle of life in his brain as instantaneously as, at a later period, when electric lighting had been everywhere installed, it became possible, merely by fingering a switch, to cut off all the supply of light from a house. I imagined, like everyone else, that the brains of other people were lifeless and submissive receptacles with no power of specific reaction to any stimulus 
which might be applied to them. I set between them far more distinctly than the mere distance in miles and yards and inches which separated one from the other, the distance that there was between the two parts of my brain in which I used to think of them, one of those distances of the mind which time serves only to lengthen, which separate things irremediably from one another, keeping them forever upon different planes, I wish only to keep in reserve in my brain those converging lines moving in the sunshine and, for the time being, to think of them no more. I would read, or rather sing his sentences in my brain with rather more dolce, rather more lento than he himself had perhaps intended and his simplest phrase would strike my ears with something peculiarly gentle and loving in its intonation. If he is rather unpleasantly affected when he tries to be paradoxical, still he has one of the finest brains that I have ever come across. Stimulate and fertilize my brain with a sense of bratting and blossoming life. The intelligence of the professor's vigorous and well-nourished brain might easily have been envied by many of the people in the society who seemed witty enough to swarm. Breast. The broad ribbon of the Legion of Honor across his breast had made Swan give that name. But unfortunately, the talker was now subordinated to another Le Grandin, whom he kept carefully hidden in his breast, whom he would never consciously exhibit, because this other could tell stories about our own Le Grandin and about his snobbishness, which would have ruined his reputation forever. Breezes. And a spotted necktie, stirred by the breezes of the square, continued to float in front of Le Grandin like the standard of his proud isolation, of his noble independence. Brightly colored cloud. He seemed to have penetrated my father's skull as if it had been a ball of glass, and to be seeing at that moment a long way beyond and behind it a brightly colored cloud. Brill. A brill because the fishwoman had guaranteed its freshness. Brow. Any of us who happened to intrude upon her at one of these moments would find her bathed in perspiration, her eyes blazing, her false hair pushed away, awry, and exposing the baldness of her brows. He passed his hands two or three times across his brow. Her friend took the girl's head in her hands and placed a kiss on her brow with a docility prompted by the real affection she had for Mademoiselle Vantoy, and as well as by the desire to bring what distraction she could into the dull and melancholy life of an orphan. She had the pleasure of receiving those kisses on her brow, those smiles, those glances, all feigned, perhaps, but akin in their base and vicious mode of expression to those which would have been discernible on the face of a creature formed not out of kindness and long-suffering, but out of self-indulgence and cruelty. There now, went on my aunt, beating her brow, that reminds me that I never heard if she got to the church this morning before the elevation. We would enter what he called his study, a room whose walls were hung with prints which showed, against a dark background, a plump and rosy goddess driving a car or standing upon a globe or wearing a star on her brow. Bubble. It was still there, like
like an iridescent bubble that floats for a while unbroken. The scent of hawthorn which strays plundering along the hedge, from which, in a little while, the dog roses will have banished it, a sound of footsteps followed by no echo upon a gravel path, a bubble formed at the side of a water plant by the current, and formed only to burst. My exaltation of mind has borne them with it, and has succeeded in making them traverse all these successive years. Buds. High up on the branches, like so many of those tiny rose trees, their pots concealed in jackets of paper lace, whose slender stems rise in a forest from the altar on the greater festivals. A thousand buds were swelling and opening, paler in color, but each disclosing as it burst, as at the bottom of a cup of pink marble, its blood red stain and suggesting even more strongly than the full-blown flowers the special irresistible quality of the hawthorn tree, which, wherever it budded, wherever it was about to blossom, could bud and blossom in pink flowers alone. Burning hot day. It was a burning hot day and she had come home so unwell that the doctor had warned my mother not to allow her again to tire herself in that way. Bushes. I must have made a rustling sound among the bushes. She would have heard me and might have thought that I had been hiding there in order to spy upon her. Bust. The inner bodice followed in complete independence, controlled only by the fancy of the designer or the rigidity of their material. The line which led them to the knots of ribbon, falls of lace, fringes of vertically hanging jet, or carried them along the bust, but nowhere attached themselves to the living creature who, according as the architecture of their fripperies drew them towards or away from her own, found herself either straight-laced to suffocation or else completely buried. Buttercup. Why, my little buttercup, my little canary boy, he's going to make Mama as silly as himself if this goes on. Buttercups. For the buttercups grew past numbering on this spot, which they had chosen for their games among the grass, standing singly, in couples, in whole companies, yellow as the yolk of eggs, and glowing with an added luster, I felt, because, being powerless to consummate with my palate the pleasure which the sight of them never failed to give me, I would let it accumulate as my eyes ranged over the gilded expanse until it had acquired the strength to create in my mind a fresh example of absolute unproductive beauty. And so it had been from my earliest childhood when from the towpath I had stretched out my arms towards them before even I could pronounce their charming name, a name fit for the prince in some French fairy tale, colonists perhaps in some far distant century from Asia, but naturalized now forever in the village, well satisfied with their modest horizon, rejoicing in the sunshine and the water's edge, faithful to their little glimpse of the railway station. Nothing was left now but a few stumps of towers, hummocks, upon the broad surface of the fields, hardly visible, broken battlements over which, in their day, the bowmen had hurled down stones, the watchmen had gazed out over Nofo, Clairefontaine, Martinville-le-Sec, 
Bayou exempt fiefs, all of them of Bramantes, a ring in which Combray was locked, but fallen among the grass now, level with the ground, climbed and commanded by boys from the Christian Brothers School who came there in their playtime, or with lesson books to be conned, emblems of a past that had sunk down and well nigh vanished under the earth that lay by the water's edge now, like an idler taking the air, yet giving me strong food for thought, making the name of Combray connote to me not the little town of today only, but an historic city, vastly different, seizing and holding my imagination by the remote, incomprehensible features which it half concealed beneath a spangled veil of buttercups. Canal. I have seen a bit of a canal in one place, and then I have turned a corner and seen another, but when I saw the second, I could no longer see the first. It must be pretty cold still on the Grand Canal. The snowy, rosy flight of the wing of a lightly poised cough, tremulously reflected in the greenish waters of a canal. Canals. To take another example, there are all the canals at Jouy le Vicomte which is Gaudiacus Vivicomitis, as of course you know. Carcass. When it was dead, Francoise mopped up its streaming blood, in which, however, she did not let her rancor drown, for she gave vent to another burst of rage, and, gazing down at the carcass of her enemy, uttered a final filthy creature. Cardoons. Cardoons with marrow, because she had never done them for us in that way before. Carnation. Halfway up the trunk of a tree, draped with wild vine, the light had grafted and brought to blossom, too dazzling to be clearly distinguished, an enormous posy of red flowers apparently, perhaps of a new variety of carnation. Carnation or hydrangea. That little pink cloud there, has it not the tint of some flower? A carnation or hydrangea. Carnation petals. He no longer based his estimate of the merit of Odette's face on the more or less good quality of her cheeks and the softness and sweetness as of carnation petals, which, he supposed, would greet his lips there should he ever hazard an embrace. Carnations. I noticed before his door a carriage and pair with red carnations on the horse's blinkers and in the coachman's buttonhole. Carp, now and then, crushed by the burden of idleness, a carp would heave up out of the water with an anxious gasp. Cat, if she had seen a cat at midnight or if the furniture had creaked. Cat and dog life. As regards figures of speech, he was insatiable in his thirst for knowledge, for often imagining them to have a more definite meaning than was actually the case, he would want to know what exactly was intended by those which he most frequently heard used. Devilish pretty, blue blood, a cat and dog life, a day of reckoning, a queen of fashion, to give a free hand, to be at a deadlock, and so forth. And in what particular circumstances he himself might make use of them in conversation. Caprio. Besides that moment, that first evening on which they had done a Caprio, when she had told him that she was coming from the Maison Dorée, 
How many others must there have been, each of them covering a falsehood of which Swan had had no suspicion? He must instantly accompany her home to do a catlia. Catlias. And long afterwards, when the arrangement, or rather the ritual presence of an arrangement, of her catlias had quite fallen into desuetude, the metaphor do a catlia transmuted into a simple verb which they would employ without a thought of its original meaning when they wished to refer to the act of physical possession, in which, paradoxically, the possessor possesses nothing survived to commemorate in their vocabulary the long-forgotten custom from which it sprang. But he was so shy in approaching her that after this evening which had begun by his arranging her catnias and had ended in her complete surrender, whether from fear of chilling her or from reluctance to appear, even retrospectively, to have lied, or perhaps because he lacked the audacity to formulate a more urgent requirement than this, which could always be repeated, since it had not annoyed her on the first occasion, he resorted to the same pretext on the following days. However disillusioned we may be about women, However, we may regard the possession of even the most divergent types as an invariable and monotonous experience, every detail of which is known and can be described in advance. It still becomes a fresh and stimulating pleasure if the woman concerned be, or be thought to be, so difficult as to oblige us to base our attack upon some unrehearsed incident in our relations with them, as was originally for Swan the arrangement of the Catlias. If she had any Catlias pinned to her bodice, he would say, it is most unfortunate. The Catlias don't need tucking in this evening. They've not been disturbed as they were the other night. I think, though, that this one isn't quite straight. Once he was left alone, he would see again that smile, and her smile of the day before, another with which she had greeted him sometime else, the smile which had been her answer, in the carriage that night, when he had asked her whether she objected to his rearranging her catlings. She found something quaint in the shape of each of her Chinese ornaments, and also in her orchids, the Catlias especially, these being, with chrysanthemums, her favorite flowers, because they had the supreme merit of not looking in the least like other flowers, but of being made, apparently, out of scraps of silk or satin. Cave. It seemed not so much the cave of Francoise as a little temple of Venus. Virgil depicts him as being received with open arms, or to be content with an image more likely to have occurred to her, for she had seen it painted on the plates we used for biscuits at Combray, as the thought of having had to dinner Ali Baba, who, as soon as he found himself alone and unobserved, would make his way into the cave, resplendent with its unsuspected treasures. Celestial geography. Like that scholarly swindler who devoted to the fabrication of forged palimpsests, a wealth of skill and knowledge and industry, the hundredth part of which would have sufficed to establish him in a more lucrative but an honorable occupation. Monsieur Le Grandin had, we insisted further, would in the end have constructed a whole system of ethics and a celestial geography of lower Normandy. Chasm. In the midst of them parted, suddenly, a gaping chasm, that moment in the 
water. Cheek. He slipped his other hand upwards along Odette's cheek. I might be able, thanks to these mental preliminaries, to consecrate the whole of the minute Mama would allow me to the sensation of her cheek against my lips. She stood there beside him, brushing his cheek, the exact spot on her cheek where I would imprint it. Cheek by jowl. She had no desire to remain on friendly terms with a person in whose house one might find oneself any day cheek by jowl. Cheekbones. The necessity, if he was to find any beauty in her face, of fixing his eyes on the fresh and rosy protuberance of her cheekbones, and of shedding out all the rest of those cheeks, which were so often languorous and sallow, except when they were punctuated with little fiery spots, plunged him in acute depression as proving that one's ideal is always unattainable and one's actual happiness mediocre. Cheeks. A bright flush animated my aunt's cheeks. An infirmity of this skin had stained part of her cheeks and her crooked nose the bright red color of balsam. He would fling himself upon this Botticelli maiden and kiss and bite her cheeks. I covered my old uncle's tobacco-stained cheeks with passionate kisses. I would lay my cheeks gently against the comfortable cheeks of my pillow, as plump and blooming as the cheeks of babyhood. In the end, they, came, they come to fill out so completely the curve of his cheeks. Pregnancy had swelled and stoutened every part of her, even to her face and the vertical squared outlines of her cheeks. Cherries. Cherries, the first to come from the cherry tree, which had yielded none for the last two years. Chestnut tree. I knew at that time as though one's life were a series of galleries in which all the portraits of any one period had a marked family likeness, the same, so to speak, tonality, this early swan abounding in leisure, fragrant with the scent of the great chestnut tree, of baskets of raspberries and of a sprig of tarragon. We sat in front of the house beneath the big chestnut tree. What had to move, a leaf of the chestnut tree, for instance, moved. Chestnut trees, sitting in the little parlor where I would pass the time until dinner with a book, I might hear the water dripping from our chestnut trees. Chestnuts. At one spot, the light grew solid as a brick wall and like a piece of yellow Persian masonry, patterned in blue, daubed coarsely upon the sky the leaves of the chestnuts. At another, it cut them off from the sky towards which they stretched out their curling golden fingers. Even in the unwooded parts, where the horizon is large, here and there against the background of a dark and distant mass of trees, now leafless or still keeping their summer foliage unchanged, a double row of orange-red chestnuts seemed, as in a picture just begun, to be the only thing painted so far by an artist who had not yet laid any other color to, on the rest, and to be offering their cloister in full daylight for the casual exercise of the human figures that would be added to the picture later on. Why, you're right. It is copied from, what shall I say? Not chestnuts, no. Oh, it's a delightful idea. Chicken. 
a fiery glow which, accompanied often by a cold that burned and stung, would associate itself in my mind with the glow of the fire over which, at that very moment, was roasting the chicken that was to furnish me in place of the poetic pleasure I had found in my walk with the sensual pleasures of good feeding, warmth, and rest. Like Francoise at Combray, when the chicken refused to die. Chickens. And meanwhile, Francoise would be turning on the spit one of those chickens, such as she alone knew how to roast. Chickens which had wafted far abroad from Combray the sweet savor of the hermits, and which, while she was serving them to us at table, would make the quality of kindness predominate for the moment in my private conception of her character. The aroma of that cooked flesh, which she knew how to make so unctuous and so tender, seemed to me no more than the proper perfume of one of her many virtues. But who would have baked me such hot rolls, boiled me such fragrant coffee, and even roasted me such chickens? Christmas tree. I should miss the Christmas tree here. 